Good evening. On Ethel the Frog tonight, we look at violence, the violence of British gangland. Last Tuesday, a reign of terror ended when the notorious Piranha Brothers, Doug and Dinsdale, after one of the most extraordinary trials in British legal history, were sentenced to 400 years imprisonment for crimes of violence. Tonight, Ethel the Frog examines the rise to power of the Piranhas, the methods they use to subjugate rival gangs, and their subsequent tracking down and capture by the brilliant superintendent, Harry Snapper Organs of Q Division. Doug and Dinsdale were born on probation in this house in Kipling Road, the eldest sons of a family of 16. Their father, Arthur Piranha, a scrap metal dealer and TV quiz master, was known to the police and a devout Catholic. In 1928, he married Kitty Malone, an up-and-coming East End boxer. Doug was born in February 1929, and Dinsdale two weeks later, and again a week after that. Their neighbour was Mrs. April Simnel. Kipling Row was a typical sort of East End street. People were running in and out of each other's houses with each other's property. Oh, they were a cheery bunch. <laughs> was it a very violent area? Oh, yes, cheerful and violent. Now, Doug, he was rather keen on boxing. That was until he learned to walk. Then he took up with putting the boot in the groin. <laughs> he was very interested in that. His mother used to have a terrible time getting him to come in for his tea. He'd be out there putting his little boot in, God bless him. Children were very different in those days. They didn't have their heads all filled up with this Cartesian dualism. When the piranhas left school, they were called up but an army board found that they were too mentally unstable, even for national service. Denied the opportunity to use their talents in the service of their country, they began to operate what they called the operation. They would select a victim and threaten to beat him up if he paid them the so-called protection money. Four months later, they started another operation, which they called the other operation. In this racket, they would select another victim and threaten not to beat him up if he didn't pay them. One month later, they hit upon the other, other operation. In this, they would threaten that if he didn't pay them, they would beat him up. This, for the piranhas, was the turning point. Doug and Dinsdale now formed a gang which they called The Gang, and used terror to take over nightclubs, billiard halls, gaming casinos and racetracks. When they tried to take over the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, they were, for the only times in their lives, slid up a treat. Me and the boys at Q Division tracked their every movement by reading the Sunday funny papers. A small time operator who fell foul of Dinsdale Piranha was Vince Snetterton Lewis. Well, I was just sitting down, threatening the kids, when I looked out through the hole in the wall, and I see this tank driver. And one of Dinsdale's boys gets out, and he comes up, all nice and friendly like. He says, I want you to come around and see Dinsdale. So, he takes me down. Chains me to the back of the tank, takes me for a scrape round to Dinsdale's place. Now, Dinsdale's there in the conversation pit with Doug and Charles Paisley, the baby crusher, and a couple of film producers, and a guy they call the Kierkegaard, who's just sitting there biting the heads off whippets. And Dinsdale says, I hear you've been a naughty boy, Clement. So, he splits me nostrils open, saws my leg off, and pulls my liver out. And then I says, my name's not Clement. And then he nails my head to the floor. He nailed your head to the floor? Well, at first, yeah. Clearly, Dinsdale inspired tremendous loyalty and terror amongst his associates. But what was he really like? When I walked out with Dinsdale on several occasions, I always found him a most charming and erudite person. He was wont to introduce one to many eminent persons, celebrated American singers, members of the aristocracy, other gang leaders. How had he met them? Through his charity work. He took a warm interest in boys clubs, sailors homes, choristers associations, Boy Scout jamborees, and of course, the household cavalry. Was there anything unusual about him? I should say not. Dinsdale was perfectly normal in every way except in as much as he felt he was being watched by a giant hedgehog to whom he referred as Spiny Norman. How big was Norman supposed to be? Well, normally Norman would be about ten feet from snout to tail, but if Dinsdale was very depressed, hmm, Spiny Norman could be anywhere up to 600 yards long. If Spiny was about, 
Din Seal would go very quiet, his nose would swell up, his teeth would move about in his mouth, he'd become very violent and go on about how he'd laid Stanley Baldwin. Dinsdale was a perfect gentleman. What's more, he knew how to treat a female impersonator. Most of these strange tales concern Dinsdale, but what of Doug? One man who met him was Luigi Bocotti. I was running a successful escort agency. High class. No, really, high class girls. There was none of that, that was right out from the start. And I decided that I wanted to open a high class nightclub. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Uh, no, no, not now. Not now. Uh, stum, stum. Right. All right. The watch will be ready at midnight. The watch. The Chinese watch. Right, OK. Bye-bye. Uh, mother. Anyway. I decided to uh, open a high-class nightclub uh, to entertain the uh, gentry in Biggles Way uh, with uh, international cuisine and cooking, uh, top-line acts. It was not a cheap clip joint picking up tarts. That was right out. I deny that completely. And anyway, one day, in walks Dinsdale with two uh, big lads. One of them is carrying a thermal uh, nuclear missile and uh, said, I bought one of their fruit machines and would I mind paying for it? How much did they want? Three quarters of a million pounds, and then they were out. Why didn't you call the police? Well, I did think of that, but I noticed that the uh, lad holding the uh, thermal nuclear tactile missile was the chief constable for the area. So they came back a week later, said my check had bounced, and then I had to uh, see Doug. Doug? Doug. I was terrified of Doug. Everyone was terrified of him. I've seen grown men tear their heads off of rather than see Doug. Even Dinsdale was frightened of Doug. What did he do? He used... sarcasm. He knew all the tricks. Dramatic irony, metaphor, bathos, parody, puns, litotes and satire. By a combination of violence and sarcasm, the Piranha Brothers, by February 1966, controlled London and the South East. Dinsdale, however, was becoming increasingly worried about Spiny Norman. He was convinced that he was sleeping in an airplane hangar at Luton Airport. This is where Dinsdale made his big mistake. began to sit up and take notice. The piranhas realised they'd gone too far and that the hunt was on. They went into hiding and I decided on a more subtle approach, viz a disguise, as the old helmet and boots were a bit of a giveaway. Luckily my years with Bristol Rep stood me in good stead as I underwent a bewildering variety of disguises. I followed them to Cardiff, disguised as the Reverend Smiler Egret. Hearing they'd returned to London, I assumed the identity of a pork butcher, Brian Stout. Arriving in London, I heard they'd returned to Cardiff, and I followed as Gloucester from King Lear. Acting on a hunch, I spent several months in Buenos Aires as Blind Pugh, returning through the Panama Canal as Ratty and Toad of Toad Hall. Back in Cardiff, I relived my triumph as Sancho Panza and Man of La Mancha, which the Bristol Evening Post described as a dazzling performance of rare perception while the Bath Chronicle was a bit less enthusiastic. In fact, it gave me a right penning. It's easy for us to judge the Piranha Brothers too harshly. After all, they only did what most of us dream of doing. Doug and Dinsdale were loonies, but they were happy. Excuse me, Squire. Doug and Dinsdale like your show very much, but they think this last bit is a, a bit unacceptable. Do you know what I mean? Well, I'm afraid I don't agree. No, no, no. We don't want to argue about it. It's just that they feel very, very strongly about this. Sorry, Squire, I broke your camera.